you have to be out there to experience, you know, the beautiful mornings, some mornings. And you, you couldn't be in a better place, you know, out off the island here, looking back in at beautiful calm mornings and seeing the sun coming up behind the hills. You, you couldn't be in a better job. There's the other side of that, of course, is when you're out there in half a gale of wind and the water's sluicing over the top of you and all the rest of it, and you're out on deck and the salt water's running off the end of your nose. <laughs> You'd wish you were elsewhere then, but there's two different sides, of it, you know. But it's not like a job ashore, it seems to get in your blood, you know. I'm a native of Peel, and I think for a meal that there's nothing like prison herring. I was read on the key, so I follow the say, and it's middling good fishing from Gerin. At every house in town, he would have salt heron, sponsored heron on a Saturday. That was a great thing, sponsored heron. Of course, us young fellas, we used to hate them. And then uh, you'd hear them saying around about the month of, uh, month of March, end of March, saying there's a bit of rust getting in the heron. Well, that was like winning the lottery, no more sponsored heron. And then uh, you used to go to the chip shop then and get, you get a big, uh, Basin of chips down at Maggie Johnson's for, and a big bottle of Urban's pop for Saturday. That was great. And then you would hear the heron coming in then for the summer. It'd be fresh heron every Saturday then. Yeah, yeah. My father would always get, or we'd always get a lot of heron. If, you know, come round the quay and you could pick the heron off the quay at that time when the boats were unloading. So you go home with 50 or 60 and your father would put them all down in the crock and the salt at the top of them and all the rest of them. And that would keep them in the winter. Like I think they used to have them when they come from the pub on a Saturday night. <laughs> oh, Artie, oh, Artie, are you coming to me party? Best suit I'll be wearing, we'll be eating spuds and herring. When the heron season started here, spring of the year, you could feel it all round the town. Everybody getting excited for the for the boats all coming and uh, the herons coming. And, oh, it was great all round about. They always wanted kippers for TT Week. Now the first heron that came in were very small. Um, they're hard to find really because first of all they used to pay maybe a couple of boats to go out early to have a look round because the heron moved round. And they didn't have the technology originally to find the herring, so they had to use old log books. Um, you know, the fishermen would write down every day where they'd been fishing, what they caught. So the old boys would pass them on to the sons or family, and they'd look back and say, well, on the 1st of June or 2nd of June, we found herring in Laxey or wherever it was. They'd go back to the same places, and nine times out of ten, they could find them. Generally, the first two boats that would arrive here would be um, two old boats called the Paragon and the Providence. They were drift net boats. They used to turn up about maybe the middle of May and they'd be at the drift nets, you know, going out and they wouldn't get a lot to start with, maybe two or three baskets of heron that would build up. When the heron started to shoal a bit off here, you got the big fellas down then from, from Campbelltown and and then the LH men from the 1st and 4th would be over then. And at this time of year now, up the harbour there, especially on these deep tides, it'd be chock-a-block of boats. You can imagine them, 100 odd boats here, all landed heron. Through the season, obviously, the heron would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the best time to get heron was probably end of July, uh, beginning of August, because they were quite big. They had a fat back and a thin belly. As you went on further in the season, they started sort of breeding off the Douglas Bank, end of August, beginning of September. That's when you see the old photos of um, salt and herring down. Because they shoaled, they were dead easy to catch because of massive shoals, huge shoals. Also, they'd have spotters up on the hills looking for the herring. But what they'd see is, because the herring were full of oil, so you'd have your waves and then you'd see like flat, because the oil had flattened it. So the spots would see the herring, and then they'd get in touch with the people and tell them where the herring were. The herring on the island here, they, uh, they were unique, really, in the amount of oil that was in them. Uh, they were just a different herring than elsewhere. I used to lie up, they'd lie up forward at the forehead of the boat with a wooden mallet, 
and there would be an old man as a rule, probably been at the job for many years, and he'd be staring down under the water. I used to lie up with him, and you could see all the mackerel be going away, shooting away like shooting stars ahead of the boat from the phosphorus of the water. And then the head would be down deep, and these old fellas would be tapping on the stem of the boat with a hammer. And that shock was going down to the water, and they could see down these hell, and they'd see the head and turn them in the water with the shock. I always remember the old fella shouting to the skipper in the wheelhouse to get the net away sort of thing and the way it went, you know. Quite right, it came up, there was 60 crown of head in that net that when they closed it. That's the 240 baskets, you know, that's a lot of head in one, ri on one ring, you know. I came down here from, the, from Scotland on the Scotch boats just to fish the hen. There was a whole fleet in Campbelltown, there must have been 40 or 50 boats, and they all came down here fishing heron in his, uh, for a few weeks. For all, and all the Irish boats? All the Irish boats are fishing. In the months of June, you'd only have the uh, splitters down, and they would be all in, in their little houses all round Peel, where they all slotted in, goodness knows. The kippers would be boxed, they were wooden boxes at that time thought the card would once come about and the girls would be uh, filling them up and then they would nail the lid on with little three quarter inch round head nails and they'd have them all in their mouth and they'd be picking them out with a little, uh, like a cobbler's hammer, putting them in and then they were on piecework. How many boxes they did, that's how much they got paid. Uh, we had all the wagons on the quay going about, you know, picking the head up and us young lads would be in the middle of it, rolling the boat with to get picking what head and we could get to take them home, you know, we'd have to go a head on each finger stuck up through <laughs> fingers. Or you'd have a piece of string and it'd have a dozen or a couple of dozen on a string taking them home, you know. So it was all good fun. Once you got July coming in, you'd get the you'd get the gutter girls coming in to cure the hair and the salt hair. The fishery girls used to come here from all over Scotland. They got got in her. Got in her and barreling them. Got them very quick. Got them by hand and put them in barrels. Salt. Yeah. The money that was going round here at that time was, was amazing, really, when you think of it. Because the pubs, the pubs were clean up with it. All the, sh the shops, even the churches, chapel, because lots of them were very religious. You know, some of them would say their prayers after they shot their nets. You know. We walked four men in the winter time on the boat, but we took two extra men on in the summer for the drift nets, for the heron. And they, they, were, they were so lonely to the kippercurers, and they took a lot of heron. You had Percy Moores up Michael Street there. That had, they were taking 200 crown a day in, same as Curtis, Donald Clucas, bottom of factory lane there. You had six fish yards up, up the mill road there. Then you had, uh, Alfred Deverell, then you had Rogers. The smoke in the town some nights, it was like smog, you could hardly breathe. <laughs> they certainly wouldn't allow it now anyway, you know. Going up Michael Street there, was the fog, the <laughs> smell of kippers, but we didn't mind it at that time. It was all money in the town, you know. In the late 50s, there was, was too much heron getting landed for the local market. Kipper curers couldn't handle all the Heron was getting landed. So a lot of it had to be come in here, put them up for auction, nobody bought them, you had to take them away off island. And then come back that night and fish again. There was no quotas or nothing. No nobody bought what you landed or what you didn't land. If there was a lot of heron in and the boats couldn't sell them, some of the boats would be given like four baskets in a crown, they'd have five baskets in a crayon going up so the buyer was getting the extra basket for nothing. That's what was tricks like that were going on, you know. But you, you could understand them doing it. If they didn't sell the heron, they either had to run across the island or, and often enough, I've stood on this breakwater here and the boats would be at the back of the breakwater here. No sail, they were dumping the heron that they'd worked all night, dumping them over the side. It just sound, you know, it's crazy. There you go. Probably late 70s, maybe early 80s, 
the North Sea shut for two or three years. So there's no herring, I couldn't buy herring. So all the buyers came from the North Sea to the Isle of Man. Of course, the Manx buyers didn't like that. They didn't want them on their patch. So um, roughly, herring used to be 20 pound a unit, which is a couple of hundred weight boxes, roughly 20 pound. Those years, so they were up to 60. I think even one day they reached 100 pound a unit, but they were between 60 and 70 pound a unit. Well, the fishermen were but absolutely made up because they were making a lot of money, a fortune like, and it was a Klondike for them. But obviously the Kippercues couldn't really make the money because the hem were too dear. Everybody come here. A massive fleet of boats, Scotland, Ireland, all the Mike's boats, everybody. And it was a Klondike. You were guaranteed to fill your boat every night. There was that much, there was that much hearing about. How many boats would there have been here? Oh, come on a minute. Then. You couldn't move. You could walk across the harbour, one Gone side up. to the other. There was that many boats. How many boats? Place full of boats. Yeah, Scotch boats. Massive big boats. They had nothing at home then. They, they closed the North Sea off for herring fishing. They all came down here. And just cleared this place up. And you got all the big Dutch luggers coming with the yeah. barrels. This was this pier was full of barrels. Come in, come in and land to them. Then they'd go away, come back again. Big, big fleet of boats. There were good days. It was a shame to see it finish. But these things happen, don't they? North Sea opened. Obviously, all the herring buyers went back to the North Sea. So the local people here who'd made very little money, if any money, they didn't want to pay £60 a unit. The herring went down to not even 20. They were between about 10, 15, 18. That amount of money. Also, they found um, a market for queenies in America for the white meat. So what happened was the Manx boats could earn more money fishing queenies than they could fishing herring. So they stopped fishing herring, and then, because if you stop fishing herring for a period of time, the quote was taken off you. So then they sold the quotas to the Irish boats. The only boats that fish herring now off here is, well, one, two, three Irish boats. The Irish. North, from the north of Ireland and a couple from the south of Ireland. The Irish boats own the, own the Isle of Man quota. They own it now. Oh, Jockin, oh, Jockin, went fishing for some block and he hooked it and he cooked it and it tasted rotten. For the past five years, really, we've been working uh, towards uh, a more sustainable form of fishing um, and there's been good cooperation between uh, industry and government in this. And part of that has been uh, making sure that we know what stock is out there. And uh, the way we've been doing that is industry has been carrying out intensive surveys um, of fishing grounds um, and we look at both the adult and the juvenile population so we know exactly what's coming through in future years so we can plan uh, plan for the future and make sure it is sustainable. The thing about sustainability is not just about looking after the stock, it's also looking after the social aspects and the economic aspects of the people that depend on the fishery. And now the shipping forecast for the North Irish Sea. Wind west or southwest, 4 or 5, occasionally 6. State of sea moderate. Weather fair, visibility good. And the outlook for the following 24 hours. Wind west or southwest, 6 or 7. Well, I go man second to none. I'm not just saying it, you know, you'd, you know when the IDC opens, everybody's wanting an IDC scallop, which is a good. It's the same with the Queenies. The Isle of Man's got the richest Queenie grounds in. Well, it's in, in the world, really. You look what's on the ground now, you've got next year's, the year after and the year after stock, so you've got plenty of stock coming through. It's just, it takes time for it to come through, that's all it is, you know? So it's, the overall picture for the young ones, it's going to be a great job to be in. But the trouble is, there's nobody wanting to be in the job, so years ago you used to have men lining on the quay, now you've got nobody, nobody wants to be here. That's the trouble. So the government has to, I don't know, give an incentive to, for youngies to get into the fishing game, I think. Because not everybody wants to be sitting in an office or doing something else, you know, they don't want to be out there in gales or wind trying to make money or the way of life that we live. You know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. 
I just think like it wasn't really a choice I made. I just loved it and I think if you find something that like you love that much as a job, especially as a job, that you should just go for it because I feel like some people find their whole life trying to find their passion and then obviously they make it a hobby or something. Well, I found my passion and I decided to turn it into a career because then, well, I think it makes me a lot happier of a person that I enjoy my job, you know. Let's get to the winner of the training fisherman of the year is Isla Gale. Yeah! Winning the training year of the world was one of the best experiences I've had. It was amazing for networking and learning new things and meeting other people. It made me feel so supported about how the Manx community reacted and I just can't thank the Manx community enough and I don't think I could have done it without them. I wouldn't expect to be treated any different because I am a woman. I think that's what a lot of people think that, oh, well, she doesn't want to do that or, oh, I bet she doesn't do that because of that. I mean, I'm always climbing around in our villages covered in oil, covered in dirt, you know. I feel like there's definitely, Al doesn't give any special treatment to me. I'd say he's harder because he knows I'll be a representation of him when he leaves the industry. And because he's had such a long stretch in the industry, I think he wants to leave something good. So he is a little hard, but I think it's just one of them things that I've got to understand and deal with and overcome. And I think that's just one of the challenges with that comes with the job. I don't believe she is the future. Hard Reese, anybody this age, because this is what the Isle of Man's working for, to bring the stocks up for a, for a future for the industry. Isla's, she's nearly there now, you know what I mean? She's going forward. She will be a skipper of one of these these boats in this, this industry. I hope this goes the same way. You need younger people like this coming through because if you don't, what's it all been for? You know, if we're the last generation that's ever going to fish and the young ones want to go elsewhere, what's it been for? Why are we doing it? In the past few years, it's been very difficult for the fishermen to make any money. And it's the same with any any job, any job that you love. You, you you may love the job, but you've still got to be able to make money for it and support your family. And uh, for the first time, really, um, since I've been working, I've been working here eight years, and for the first time now, the number of boats actually matches um, the the stock. Ten years old, I first went out with my father. Full time since I was 16, so couldn't really see myself doing anything else. I tried doing some of the stuff, you know, I started a marine engineering apprenticeship, but yeah, I was always drawn to the boats. The freedom of the job is the attraction. It's not a normal job, it is, it's, it's more than a job, it is a, it is a lifestyle. You know, it, it does dominate your life, but wouldn't have it any other way. It is hard to get people in because, yeah, it's it's not an attractive way of living because you can't go out and party every weekend. You can't just have the normal life that you have. You are going away fishing all the time, and yeah, that's the way it is of being a fisherman. You're basically your own boss at the end of the day. The only person well, I answer to is Craig. Oh, very hard work, especially with going out with Craig. You, you hear any, see any type of weather, always having fun though. The future of the industry, from my personal opinion, is it'll be more settled, more stable. It won't be boom and bust like the previous however many decades, which I suppose is better in the, the long run for sustainability and I don't see it being as big an industry around the island, but for the, 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 the boats that are here, I do see it being profitable. At this present time, the biggest challenge is definitely running costs, fuel, price of steel for gear, and but it's the way the world is at the minute across the board, you know. 
every industry has its sob story of its own, I suppose. I think sustainability has to be a good thing long term in any anything. You know, without sustainability, there is no industry.